Hello and welcome. In this episode, I speak with Swami Matananda and Swami Premananda about their connections to Swami Radha, as well as their spiritual marriage. We discuss the theme of love and the importance of care, consideration, and independence in relationships. Hi, Swami Matananda and Swami Premananda. Hi. Hello. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today, especially because this is the first ever live recording in person of the podcast series. And it's the first time ever I'm interviewing two people at once. Mm. And another thing, it's especially an honor for me to be interviewing Swami Matananda because I really see you as my first teacher here at the ashram when I first entered in in the two-month program. So it's a joy. Thank you. Shall we say the Divine Mother prayer together? Okay. Oh, Divine Mother, Me. may all my speech and idle talk be mantra. All actions of my hands be mudra. All eating and drinking be the offering of oblations unto thee. All lying down prostrations before thee. May all pleasures be as dedicating my entire self unto thee. May everything I do be taken as that we should. So I thought we could begin with you kind of speaking about your relationship and how you first met one another and also the kind of relationship you have now. Yeah, I think we first met in Alaska. I used to live in Alaska. I went there to do some business and uh, look at some things. And I met Matinanda, who was Deborah then. There, and we went on a trip together in a small private airplane down to Naknek, which is a, on Bristol Bay, and it's a fishing area. We flew down there, and we watched grizzly bears and the, lots of grizzly bears and things like that. And and we went back to Fairbanks, which is where we were, and we stayed there for a week or so, and then I went back to Denver, and at one point she moved to Denver, and we started living together. That was, I guess, in, I don't remember what year that was, like 80-something. 1984. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 1984. And today, who are you to one another? Well, it's been a, a journey. We were living together for, I don't know, quite a while, 84 to 87, three years. Yeah, so we were living together for three years in Denver. And toward that end of that period, it was kind of tumultuous. And Felicity Green came and stayed at our house. Premananda had fixed up the basement apartment because he found out that someone from his yoga class needed a place to stay. And so she stayed with us and talked about the ashram and talked about the straight walk and and talked about that it was a place of self-inquiry. And anyway, we both for probably different reasons, we thought it sounded interesting because we were kind of at a crossroads. And so Premananda called up a Swami Radhakrishnananda and talked to her, and then we read the book, Diary of a Woman's Search, and uh, Premananda read it first and loved it, and he told me to read it, so I did. And yeah, we... uh, Got ready to go. We'd been trying to sell our house for quite a few months, and nothing had happened yet. But as soon as we made the decision to take the 10 days of yoga, the house sold. We had a huge garage sale. We packed up all our stuff and our cat and took a trip Mm -hmm. from Denver to Vancouver. Dropped off our cat at a friend's house and uh, came for the 10 days of yoga. We didn't really know what we were doing. We were both kind of in a place in our lives where we wanted to do something different. And Felicity Green said that the reason they couldn't sell the house was because we didn't know what we were doing. And then we signed up for the 10 days. Of course, we were going to come regardless of if we sold the house. And uh, anyway, she went to Boston right after that. She was an Iyengar teacher, an Iyengar yoga teacher. And she went, they have an annual workshop every year gathering and she went to that in Boston and I think she was gone about a week and she called me and she asked me how things were going and we 
by that time we had a contract on the house and uh somebody was buying the house and it closed i think on october 1st and i think our course here started october 8th or something like that and so we were able to do everything and and get here we got here kind of late didn't we here the, yeah. the night of the course i think <laughs> we were on the ferry that late ferry. anyway we this thing was already started like, yeah we we thought well we can really race and get this one or we can not race and get the next ferry and we decided the latter we were a little bit you know worried <laughs> So then you arrive at the ashram for the course, and then what happens? Was Swami Radha here, or did you start the workshop and just kind of meet the teachings first in that way? Yeah, it was the 10 days of yoga. No, she wasn't here at that time. Yeah, and then after the 10 days, he could stay on for six weeks, and so we did. We both took to the place, and I just remember the first day coming here and going up the stairs not the first night when we came into the class, but the next day, just going up those, you know, 70 stairs or however many stairs those are, <laughs> just thinking, oh my gosh, this is all about God. And I hadn't put that together in my mind for some reason. The, that devotional aspect of it, I thought that was very interesting, that it wasn't until I got here that I realized that. And we enjoyed doing the work and being with all the other teachers and the area leads, I guess we would call them now, and we had lots of talks with people, and everyone seemed to take us under their wing as we were kind of new, and it was a, yeah, it was a good experience. And then I, I can't remember how we first, how Swami Rana got to know us. It was a, doing the YDC, I think. Mm -hmm. Which we left uh, here in, uh, in December, I think. And we were going to try to come back for uh, the YDC. Matananda had a car and she didn't have the money for the YDC. And so she was trying to sell her car. And so she's, we went to Alaska together for Christmas. And uh, while we were in Alaska, her mother sold her car for her and we had enough money. We came back and did the YDC. And Swami Radha came during the YDC. And Swami Rudd almost died that year when we were here in the summer. And uh, all these people were coming to say their last words to her. And that was in 1988 in the summer. And she recovered. And then, yeah. What were your first impressions of her? Well, you know, I can't really say that I, I, I remember the first time I saw her, actually. But the, the first times that I got to know her were related to the next summer after the YDC. But one of the things that we did when we were here is that she, um, I think she was the instigator, but she had asked Madananda to make drawings of the temple because we had a foundation for the temple, but the temple was not built. And there were no real drawings. She had a drawing that she made on a napkin that Swami Radha made. So Deborah, Swami Matananda, made a series of drawings about the temple, about how it would look from... From what she described. Yeah, that was, I was working in the garden as the garden lead, not knowing very much about gardening, <laughs> and uh, working in the children's program. And then she gave me this job to make drawings, so it was kind of like my little respite time. And she told me later how important it was for certain kinds of minds, like that were non non abstract thinkers. She said, you know, the people who are kind of like artist types, that it's good for them to learn through doing something artistic or something that there can be a product. And so she gave me the product of <laughs> drawing these pictures of the temple, which I've never seen since I drew them. So I gave them to her, and we've looked for them. Oh, yeah. I can you imagine? Can't find them. Um, but I remember it, taking it really seriously and feeling pretty honored to to do that. And so, and then kind of brainstorming different kind of roofs, and then drawing different pictures with different colors of roofs, and, and Kamananda would get involved and say, well, what if we had a copper roof? 
And then Paramananda started making these models of the temples. And so we were both doing these kind of creative things all about the temple that hadn't come into fruition yet. Yeah, so she knew how to work with this. And then Paramananda started building the temple with other, you know, lots of other builders. And he's an experienced builder, so that worked out handily. That must have been a really special time to be able to offer her things that you already kind of knew, like you on your creative drawing side, and then you coming from that place of an experienced builder and being able to serve her in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you used to make, and Swami Rada would ask Permananda to make all these things to help her arthritis in her hands and make these little slings and, uh, I don't know, what we, would you call them braces and... Or at least covering them with deer skin and just making them where she liked them. She was in a lot of pain sometimes with her arthritis, and uh, the deer skin and the th- things that supported her were really helpful to her. I can't remember all the, exactly the, the sequence of things, but we left here and we didn't want to go very far away. And uh, Matananda wanted to make enough money so that she could live here. So we went to Hope, Idaho, and we went there and we, we, rented a cabin on the lake for a year, and uh, Matananda was going to substitute teach, and uh, I was coming up here to work on the temple. And uh, Swami Radha really loved karma yoga. You know, that was one of her main things, and she really liked to watch people work. And she liked, and she liked to work too, but when we knew her, she wasn't as much of a worker anymore. But when we were working on the temple, she had the boys, who she, I think she called us boys, come over in the, the little screen house. We had a little screen house right here at the, by, by the pond and uh, had us over for German chocolate cake, which is one of the things she really enjoyed doing was having uh, dessert with people and sweet things. And uh, anyway, that was the first time I really knew her. And, and then she was always kind of watching me when I was on the te- at the temple working. And uh, she just really liked working and... Um, and then uh, after that, she, we were trying to get citizenship to Canada to move here, and she bought a house in uh, Spokane, and she suggested that we move to Spokane from Hope and uh, help start the yoga center there. And so we went there, and uh, that was in October again, I think, and left Hope. And when I was in Hope, I made seven models of the temple, little models that... Uh, they had little lamps in them, so they were like little lamps. And we made one. I made one for each of the Rada centers. There were seven Rada centers then, and they were like a fundraising kind of thing. Anyway, she really liked that as well. And then when we moved to Spokane, I rented a, a space, a commercial space for my shop because I had all these tools and everything. And so she came to Spokane when we were living there, and Julie or Swami Lalita Nanda was driving her at that time, and they came to Spokane, and. Uh, she came to my shop, and it was, it was kind of a neat shop. It was, it was upstairs. It had a big freight elevator, and it was in kind of a building that didn't was pretty empty. And she really liked the shop. And then she suggested that uh, instead of me having this shop, which was kind of in a kind of an industrial area and not real attractive or anything, she suggested that I build a shop at the house, and so that I wouldn't have to go somewhere. And then I could do things. And so she started me with a process with her of designing a shop for the house. And so I was making drawings, and uh, and she also asked me to design an altar, too. And she went back to Victoria, and I, we were back and forth with contact. And uh, she had me make little cutouts of all the kinds of tools and so you could move them around. It was a pretty involved process, and I had nearly ever done that before. And then she calls me up and she says, uh, oh, and I made her a bird feeder, a really nice bird feeder, and she really liked that. I sent it to her. And anyway, she called and she said that not the right time to build a shop, but uh, she was going to Calgary. And uh, she had a house in Calgary, a right a house, and she wanted to know if I would want to come and be with her in Calgary to build this, you know, to, she said it was like a, rearranging things a little bit or something. And uh, when I got there, uh, she was there, and uh, 
or she got there after me, I think. And we started talking about it. And anyway, it turned out that the best thing probably to do was just to build a little addition to the house rather than trying to rearrange things. And stuff. And so I kind of made a little plan and, uh, it was, I think like a 16 by 20 room or something like that, kind of a, just for yoga room. And, uh, and was her caregiver at that time or her part, the guy that was with her the most. And, uh, he and I, and, uh, he helped a little bit with it. And then I had a couple of local people that were, uh, karma yogis that helped. And so we built this, uh, room and I was there exactly six weeks, I think. And we got it all finished except for, uh, the linoleum on the floor, I think. And it couldn't go because the concrete was still not dry. And then when we left, she said, uh, I would say thank you, but, uh, I don't want to take away from your experience of karma yoga. <laughs> so I really got to know her quite well. And, uh, because we lived together and we took turns cooking and, and she ate with us and Swami Radha Krishnananda was there at the time. She was a brand new Swami because mm -hmm. she was here when we took the YDC, but she wasn't a Swami then. And then we just stayed there for six weeks. We worked and and she said that, um, she said I was one of the only people she knew that could work a full day or something like that. Cause I was, it was, it's pretty intense being with Swami Radha and there's no, uh, nobody ever rests, you know, it's, I mean, it's, some people do, I guess, but it's kind of like, you're always kind of on edge a little bit. Edge isn't the right word, but you're certainly super aware, okay. alert, yeah, alert and attentive and uh, careful. And we had this table in, in uh, Calgary, which is the table we have here. It's a yellow, a white table, blue glass top. And, uh, when you sit at it, it's a wrought iron and it just jiggles. So we all ate at this table and it was like, you couldn't really sit and eat and use the thing without jiggling things. And it really was hard around her because she was very sensitive and stuff. And you know, things would spill and anyway, so it was really a delicate operation that, and, uh, but we had a, a few, you know, just about how to do things. And, uh, and I think I questioned her because I didn't really understand the guru and disciple relationship that well. And, uh, it became a little bit, um, tense and at a certain point, uh, she didn't eat with me <laughs> and, uh, it was a, a very much a learning experience. I learned a lot from working with her because she questioned everything, you know, and, uh, but in a good way, she didn't know that much about building in a certain sense, but she knew about the processes. And so I learned a lot about how to do things and it really was a a good experience, I think. And she used to call me the master builder and I called her the master planner. So we had a working relationship. Yeah, and it sounds like you were just willing to offer your services and what you knew. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's interesting because I hadn't, I mean, I'd always kind of done things like that a little bit, but uh, you know, just to go off to Calgary from Spokane to which somebody I didn't even know, it was a jump, but it didn't seem like it at the time, I don't think. And she really loved Montananda, I think. <laughs> she really liked her a lot. And that helped, you know, that helped the whole relationship thing. Because she had uh, a lot of experience with couples. And it was always a bit interesting because she, uh, in some ways, at least in most cases that I know about, the women were more into the teachings than the men. And she was very accommodating to that, but she didn't want to break up relationships and so forth, but she wanted them to evolve the relationships. And so she was harder on the women, I think, because they were actually doing the work and stuff. And the men were kind of reluctant devotees, I would say, in some ways. And uh, she always accommodated them, and uh, they all really liked her. Uh, not all of them, but I mean, it seemed like, uh, and they were, they just hung around for a long time, a lot of them. And, and she, uh, she really tried to develop the relationships. And I think a lot of the evolving of relationships is towards the evolving towards the end of the relationship, I think. And I think that's what happens, but you know, 
And she used to say, you know, if you give me your hand and then it's your arm and then it's the whole body kind of thing. And, and, uh, that's, uh, every, not everybody, but people reach a certain point where that's all they can give. Right. And they can't go any further. And so that, uh, <laughs> changes things when you can't give, because it's a, it's a gross thing. And if you stop growing and stop wanting to grow, then there's no reason to be there anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and it sounds like through your service, you were able to keep showing up and keep that growth going. And I wonder for you, Swami Matananda, what that process was like beyond the drawings of the temple. I know a little bit about other drawings that she had asked you to offer and just the process of working with her and offering your service. Right, right. So that was, I guess, that, that was the first thing before I did the drawings of the poetry. So it was to learn how to design books because she was writing her dream book and before that the mantra book was being reprinted and she had me start to work in the composition room we called it and in those days when you made books and magazines and things well we had a printing press that would print them and then to lay them out we didn't have computers yet and so you'd have these big yellow sheets with all these squares on them and you know, cut out photos and put them on and do all this stuff with a very fine knife. And then there was a photography studio and Pramananda worked in the photography studio because he's a photographer as well. And then they make, you know, half tones and whatever you make for magazines. And, and then you paste it up, like paste it up on a piece of paper and then take pictures of it and then print it, put it on these really thin plates. And anyway, it's all very physical. And I enjoyed that quite a bit. And then when they were, I was working on the Ascent magazine first. And that was where I first came in contact with her, kind of guiding me. And I did this one cover of the Ascent magazine, and it was a, of a bridge. <laughs> and Pramananda had taken this photo of a bridge, and I'd kind of made it so that part of it was you know, like the negative of the photo, and part of it was like the positive of the photo. Anyway, there were two parts of it. She was very worried. She came over. She would come over to the composition room. Someone would be with her, and she would talk to me, and she said, you cannot be the good wife. <laughs> and I was trying to understand what did that have to do with the bridge picture because I couldn't really put it together <laughs> in my mind. But it was something to do with the fact that Pramananda took the picture and that I wanted it for the cover. And that's all I could come with. But it didn't really matter. I knew it did not matter what the sense or logic was of it, but that she was trying to give me advice on how to be a spiritual aspirant and be married at the same time. Mm -hmm. And part of that was to be non-attached and, uh, and not to have like that idea of favoritism and so uh, which kind of hard to do you know when you're in a relationship because you kind of think that's what you do <laughs> and uh, yeah so for all the years we've been here so we've been here like 30 something years and it's a constant practice is to learn how to be independent and also to care for one another and she would help me to understand, you know, like when my mother got sick and I was saying, oh, well, I shouldn't talk to her because I'm non-attached. And she said, what do you mean? <laughs> Just talk to her. She needs you. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, so is it not like that? <laughs> Don't just detach. But, so the, the two things would be, you know, not being attached and caring. So that was my first lesson. And then the, the, the evolving part of that is to just understand that care isn't attachment. You know, they are separate things. And so I feel that now we're, or me, I should say for me, I am learning more about how to care and how to evolve myself. And I find that because just recently we started living together after being apart for 30-odd years. 
in the ashram, we would be in separate places and, you know, that kind of thing. And now we're living in the same kind of building and, you know, doing things together like, you know, washing dishes and cleaning house and, you know, the things that bring out everything. And I just find how wonderful a practice it is to be with a friend and see all the things that come up and so that I see myself better mm. and that I can uh, eradicate some of those things I would wish not to have present on the day I die. Like, really, mm. you know, take care of these things. And I think this 30 years of being independent, you know, like more independent simply because we're not in proximity as much, is uh, was a wonderful gift because I think we both developed more independence and, you know, and developed our friendship in a different way than we would have. Great. I feel like that was such a good move towards the theme of today, which is the theme of love. Having known that you both are kind of considered to be in a spiritual marriage, as a young person myself, I would just love to know kind of your thoughts on what that is. But before we get into that theme, I'm going to read um, a short excerpt I found from Swami Radha on this theme of love. She writes, Love has to be examined in conjunction with biological urges and personal needs. We have to look at what happens to love when our emotions interfere. We have to investigate how, from all this confusion, love can eventually emerge. So my question for you both is, what does love mean to you? And what have you learned about love as a couple living at the ashram together? Yeah, I think love is a pretty complex idea. You know, it's, it's hard to try to explain what, uh, you know, what love is even, you know, let alone uh, what I've learned about it. I think uh, Swami Radha, I don't, anyway, I, I never heard that before. I, I guess you read it the other day, but uh, I think she had, um, I don't know, she, she had, you know, the, the book, uh, Made the Dance to the Cosmic Dance, she talks about uh, about love and about relationships. And uh, one of the main things that uh, that I remember her saying, and I, I you know, is uh, love not having any, attachments to it like uh not uh, i love you because you know and and so it really gets to be a pretty subtle thing i think and also a pretty complex thing and uh, and it's a it's a word uh, you know if you think of it as a word it's a well it's a four-letter word for one thing i guess but it's also it's like um so overused you know and and misused and uh and you know you hear people saying it all the time in his workshops about love and things and uh and Swami Radha I think had a very practical view about love and what it meant and how it's used so inappropriately a lot and uh, and you know even just about like even like food or things you know like I love chocolate or and she would challenge those kinds of statements you know so I, I think you know and, and I think she would maybe agree with that is that I think one of the main things that she would talk about is consideration, you know, and, uh, you know, it's even about, uh, people and, uh, you know, it's like, she was very aware that all the people that were here, you know, a lot of them would not really have any interaction with each other if they didn't live here, you know, like if they were out in the world, they wouldn't gravitate towards each other even maybe other than having a common goal of the teachings. But she said it wasn't, important that you like the people you know that you live with uh, uh, you know be, but it is important to be considerate and to treat them with respect and honor and that sort of thing and yeah and so i i don't know it's like um the other thing you know is people talk about falling in love you know and i, I, mean, I don't even understand what that means but uh you know it's like a, it, it was she's talking about getting away from biological urges and things and i think that that's what falling in love is is more of a biological kind of thing mostly and uh and that it's not uh, 
it's not very sustaining even, you know, it's, and it's not something that you can continue with, you know, it's like that kind of quality of love. And so the consideration and friendship is a very much a part of love. And, uh, and I think as you get older, you know, and I am an elder now, so it's a, uh, it's, uh, you know, those biological urges and things are not the same as they are when you're 18 or 20 or something like that. You know, it's like, uh, love takes on a whole different meaning for people in different stages of their lives. And so at the stage of life that I'm in, it's learning to enjoy what's happening and, uh, and trying to, um, do the best I can in, in whatever relationships I have. And, you know, like loving, uh, the ashram is a, is a thing, you know, and it has nothing to do with biological urges or anything like that. It's a, it's more of a, um, conceptual and kind of a, um, thing to do with the heart and, the and that, you know, the love is so much associated with the heart and, and, um, and I think that's one of the things that Swami Rod and I really had in common too, was the uh, care of the ashram and, uh, you know, and that's what, uh, you know, she provided this for us and she loved this place and she loved the teachings. And, uh, and so I try to follow that example and, uh, and it's not easy and it's, uh, there's always more to do than can be done. And, but I really love the ashram and I love taking care of it. Yeah. It sounds like those themes of consideration, care, friendship become really central. Well, they become more and more important, I think. And, um, and I think just the sensitivity, you know, becoming more, more sensitive and more aware of other people's sensitivity. And I continually have to work on, you know, just, uh, you know, tone of voice and stuff like that. Like she was so alert and aware, you know, that, you know, she could determine what was going on just by the words you used or the, the way your voice sounded or your expressions or the way you sat or, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> but in a very, very, you know, she was a very loving person and yet she was also very stern in a certain way. When I wasn't living up to who I was thinking I was and who she expected me to be, then that was a, a point of sternness. Yeah, she was just very loving that way, you know, and, and very supportive and, you know, the, just looking at these pictures and, you know, she encouraged us very much to have a spiritual wedding, which she performed, well, Radhananda, Swami Radhananda actually performed it, but we were, she was there and uh, she was the instigator of it in many ways and we had just a wonderful party at her house uh, and, um, and she really always encouraged us to uh, stay together and love one another. You know, that's what she said in her last message. And it's a very nice message. And uh, and uh, she meant the love, you know, you know, more of consideration and sensitivity and stuff and not the you know, grasping or whatever kind of physical love. Yeah, in the Kundalini book, she writes something about touching is not grasping. And I think that has so much to do with that theme of love. And I feel like subtly we've been talking about commitment. And so Matananda, you already touched on that aspect of favoritism and how you felt like she was pointing you towards not doing that in your, in your marriage. What were some other things that were coming up for you while working with her and being married and, and what has continued to show up? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it feels good to hear you talk about how she really supported us. I, I felt like our spiritual wedding was such a gift. It was right before the mantra pronouncement, so in two days' time. So it was on September 6th, and on September 8th, she gave the mantra pronouncement to all these people, which we were two of those people as well. And and then, yeah, two days before that, she arranged, uh, you know, we wrote little papers about spiritual marriage and what we would do and how we would be with each other. And I was just reading them over, and yeah, we definitely keep repeating the same things that, you know, she used to talk about this image of going to the top of the mountain and that, you know, as a couple, we'll both be going to that same height 
and yet we'll have different routes to get there. You know, maybe different times where one person is going in a certain direction or maybe going around or maybe coming back down a little bit and then going back up. <laughs> you know, so we have our separate journeys, our separate paths, and we will meet there at the top. And somehow we're helping each other to do that. And that's what I think is so wonderful about having a, you know, a marriage with a spiritual focus is that we use, and, and I'm just getting to learn this now because we are in closer proximity, is that we use the daily uh, emotional events, the daily uh, growing events, with each other, you know, just our little interactions that you have with another person that is different from you <laughs> to learn more and to get closer to the top of the mountain. So that's what it's for. You know, it's like our marriage isn't for anything else except that. And, you know, that that aspect of it is much more clear to me now. Mm. And I'm much more able, you know, there's certain emotional things that happen that's kind of hard to... You can't really eradicate all these emotional reactions. And yet now when I have them, I see them a lot more quickly than I would with another person. Because I already know all the history that we have had, and I know all the history we haven't had. <laughs> and I also am finding that there's still so much to learn about each other that yeah, sometimes I think I know, and I actually don't. Mm. And so I really appreciate that aspect of just having this time together it's in this latter stage of our lives. To learn and to grow mm -hmm. and to evolve. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's definitely for evolution. I feel that it's a, our way now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like it takes, though, a lot of awareness and, again, that piece of commitment and you've both kind of touched on this already but this idea of being independent but then also being a couple and I found another quote by Swami Radha that I just thought was really interesting and really carried that idea she writes trust love and affection do not grow if we try to possess and limit another person and so you've already spoken about that in some ways, even in your mountain analogy. And I wonder, as two people who are both on the spiritual path, but at the same time care for one another and have made a commitment to one another, how do you work with the two dynamics of being in a relationship and also being independent and being on your own personal path? The independence and the and the attachment, those two dynamics. Yeah, well, it's... A <laughs> Slippery slope. <laughs> <laughs> well, living here, you know, we work as a community. We have all these meetings and that kind of thing. And so, just as an example, like being in a meeting, if one of us is maybe in a hot seat, sort of, or maybe just everyone's attention is on them in the meeting, I just find I have to very much distance myself if it's Premananda, and uh, just to keep relaxing and not giving any input because I feel like my input is a little bit skewed. And so I've learned to just be very silent and calm and, and trusting that whatever is going to happen in that moment, you know, I have this tendency to want to protect people. And, you know, there's no place for that really. So I'm just quiet, and, and then I notice time and time again that things happen the way they should, and it's really not up to me to decide anything for, for Brahmananda and uh, just to let it happen. Yeah, and we've written lots of papers about that, about not limiting each other and supporting each other if we have a spiritual practice or if we're, you know, some kind of a role, <laughs> like to support each other in that. Mm -hmm. And I guess it goes back to that piece of letting one another grow in in your own separate ways, but then meeting one another again and again. 
Well, one of the things that happens at the ashram or has in the past a lot is the ashram is very aware of people that are in a relationship, whether they know it or not, and that sort of thing. And uh, oftentimes, you know, it's just like when I was in Spokane and Swami Rada asked me to go to Calgary, Swami Rada asked Montanon, did they go to Victoria? They asked, I went to uh, Montreal to work on the building we bought there. Spent time there. I spent to went to uh, Spokane. Did work there. I went to Swami Rada had me build her a little bridge in uh, in uh, Burnaby, and then worked on the Rada building. And so all these things are we're asked to do things that uh, don't uh, necessarily coincide with being together or living together, and and that is a, a surrender practice in a certain sense, and. And it used to be like that quite a bit, you know, that Swami Rada would ask people to do things. And she often asked people to do things they didn't know how to do or didn't want to do, perhaps. But it was a way of helping people become less attached to each other, you know, living apart, living together, going here, going there. And uh, and she was very aware of what she was doing in these situations, right? And it wasn't to separate people, but it was, well, she had her goals in mind, I think, for like a, doing a building project or a book or something. But also it was just to lessen that attachment. And I think that's what we've done a lot. And uh, now we're in a different situation. And and so it's, uh, but we've had a lot of practice with uh, being apart. And we've had a lot of practice of letting go and uh, surrendering that, uh, those kinds of things. And uh, and it's just a perfect place to practice that here, you know, because it's uh, it comes up all the time. And uh, the the thing here, you you, know, you have to be willing to uh, talk about things and enter into things, right? Because uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to my next question. I know that you both played a role here in the community when when couples come and enter in together. And kind of your role as a facilitator and talking with them and and kind of guiding them in how to be in relationship while also sort of focusing and emphasizing their own evolutionary path. And so I'm wondering if there are certain patterns or issues you've noticed in romantic relationships, young and old, that you would like to speak about. Well, I think one of them is if it comes to us that we're going to meet with either a couple or a person who's part of a couple and wants to talk about how to kind of integrate those two, spiritual life and being in a relationship. The first thing that I I find is really helpful for people to know is that it is regular life, that there isn't anything esoteric or out of this world that they should know. It really is using what they know, what they come up with, what the arguments are, what the strengths and weaknesses of the relationship are in a daily way, like using those examples or those situations to evolve themselves. And so there, there's, you know, often people say, yeah, well, I think I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that. And I And it's like, well, not really, you know, whatever you're doing, use it as a way to reach the most high, put quality into it. And so it's not like you're going to do something like spiritual in quotation marks, but quality is so easy for people to understand. And I know Swami Radha talked about that with us a lot. And, you know, she talks about it in Karma Yoga, put quality into everything you do, you know, polishing the glass washing the dish, digging the ditch, whatever you're doing, like put quality into it. And and that goes with relationship and it gets to more subtle levels. And, you know, like Kramananda's talking about the tone and how you look and how you listen. And she put us through some exercises about how to listen to each other better. And those things are very basic. You know, there's not no... A mystery about it in a certain way, and yet hearing someone say it who's been through it is so helpful. So I find that's really the most helpful thing is to know 
that you can use anything you do as as a road or a journey to the Most High. And that includes a relationship. It's a really wonderful way to learn because you can't be focused only on yourself or it doesn't, you, you know, you just won't be able to sustain the relationship. We just try to help them understand what's the what's happening here and, and what we, you know, how, how we've gotten to where we are. And it's so natural, you know, for people to get together, you know, young people to get together and it's just, it's not the right place. Yeah. And then it also, again, goes back to that piece of attachment and independence and how, in my mind, like, especially at the beginning of relationships, like, like you said, there's they often so much infatuation and so much discovery required to happen. And I think to be in a place like the ashram and to be doing that, it inevitably ripples out to the community. And I think that's a really important part, but also interesting to hear what you're saying, Swami Matananda, about people who come who are already in relationship, really emphasizing that quality and how everything that they do and we do can be made into a way to grow and mm. learn about ourselves. For sure. And we're nearing the end of our wonderful conversation together. And I wanted to ask two questions to go back to Swami Radha and, and your relationships with her. And I wondered if both of you could share a memory that you have with her, one that you hold dear to your heart. And then also the question of how do you connect with Swami Radha today? How is she present for you now? I think I'll talk about the time where she gave me this ring, because when you asked that last question, how do you connect with her now? I have this ring that she gave me, you know, in the very beginning of our relationship with her. And and I was just reading some of my papers about spiritual marriage and all those kind of things. But one of them I just happened upon was about the the story of this ring. And it, uh, I used to go over to many mansions when Swami Radha was here that first year that I knew her. And she she just said, just come over anytime. And for me, that was like a real challenge because it, it wasn't like she would say, come here now and we'll have tea and then you can go. It was more like I had to figure out when to come and just kind of hang around and be there. And anyway, so I would be looking at all these art books and drawing pictures from them. And um, and, and then sometimes she would come in and interact with me. And anyway, this one day, it was actually my birthday, she uh she said, come over here to the couch. And so I came over and she said, close your eyes, hold out your hand. And then she dropped this ring into my hand. And and then I, you know, so sweet, oh my God. And then she said, so I'll tell you the story. This is the color black. It's a black onyx stone. And it was Radha's favorite color. And when Swami Radha was being told this story, she said to the other Swamis, well, why would it be black? There's so many other more beautiful colors for Radha. And, and Gurudev Shivananda told her, it's because it represents that part of Krishna that is unknown, that cosmic consciousness that is a mystery. And so that's what it represents. And that was when she told me about the artistic people and how they need something a little more tangible and that that unknowing the part that is unknown is what i want to go toward the part that isn't manifest it's unmanifest that was a special moment and the just a little caveat to that story is that once i was in nelson the town nearby here and the the stone from this ring fell out and i was you know i didn't know when it had fallen out i would walk on the streets in nelson and and at least it wasn't snowing, so it wasn't that kind of weather. But I, I retraced every single step, and then I found it. <laughs> and I could not believe that I found this little piece of black stone in a city, but I did. So it was like one of those things where sometimes you lose something that's precious to you, and then you want to think about that. And uh so it was just a, another message to keep that going, that uh, trying to understand 
something beyond the physical. That's very precious. Thank you for sharing. A couple of things. One is that you know, I used to make these graces for her, but uh, she asked me to come over, and uh, and then she said that she was doing these exercises and that she needed uh, to get down on the uh, floor on her back, and uh, she had me come over every day and uh, help her, you know, get down onto her back, and it was pretty kind of a, a special kind of thing, and. Because I tend to be kind of clumsy around her, I think, and and uh, you know, partially because trying to be alert, but then it just seemed like it had the opposite effect. But then she she gave me this ring, and um, she said that I was her spiritual son, and uh, it's a um, perpetual knot or something like that, and. Uh, and she gave that to me. And at that time, I was taking care of her a little bit, but I was also uh, looking after the cows and the chickens and stuff. And the ring that she gave me was a little bit too big. I might have even put some tape on it, but it it was a little too big. And I don't know how long I had it, but maybe two or three days. I don't know. It could have been a week. I can't remember. But anyway, I was going to get it adjusted, you know, at a jeweler. And... Uh, I lost it. It was gone, and uh, I was just looking uh, everywhere. I mean, uh, like you, I was going, I was going to the barn and just looking everywhere, and I, I never found it. And I, I was really hard to tell her that, right? but I figured I had to tell her, right? And so uh, I made this one, which is a out of brass. I just made one so I could wear it uh, because. And then I went and I told her and I showed it to her and and she was she was very good about it. She said it's you you'll find it when it's time to find it or something like that. That was in uh, I guess about 1993, something like that. And then years later, well, we went to Spokane after the YDC in 98, uh, 98. We did the YDC in the 98 for the second time, and we went to. After that, we moved to Spokane for about a couple of years to study video and also for me to do my book reflections and things because I didn't do them for the first YDC. And uh, so we went there and then we were uh, coming back and uh, I just finished my book reports and I was going into the training. And I finished my book report after we got here and a woman named Elizabeth Quinn was here. She became Bhakti. Anyway, she was working in the garden, and she found this ring. She showed it to you, right? And you said that was my ring. And so that was the day I finished my book reports, I got my ring back. And of course, while I thought it was gone then, but she was sure I was going to get it back, she said. And uh, anyway, it was kind of special. I, uh, today, I just remember her often just about, uh, you know, things come to my mind when interactions or when I'm doing something or Everywhere around here is her, you know, in a way, like I had some, you know, we did the Mandela house together and we did lots of things together. And, uh, and then I play her mantra at, uh, in my room mostly. And it's uh, Hari Om and it's, it's just like, it's, it's, she's really here in so many ways. Right. And yet, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and you know, there's pictures of her stuff, but mostly it's just kind of, she's just part of me, I think, in a way. <laughs> has been such a pleasure to hear about your experience and your wisdom. And I'm so grateful for both of you for making this time and sharing all these stories. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. Yashodra Ashram is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Tanaha and Sanaixt peoples. You can learn more about the ashram by visiting our website at yashodra.org. You can also follow us on Instagram and YouTube. Until next time, I'm Katie Taher, and this is My Time with Radha.